But if you walk in and give some love, people know the difference just like animals know the difference. We all got instincts. So that's how I balance those two worlds. That's how I help people approach business and real estate. Because how you do anything is how you do everything. So you got to do it that way for you to do it in real estate. So I'm not telling you, do it in real estate this way. I'm saying do it in life this way. Then you're going to do it in real estate this way. Welcome to the Aid to Assets podcast, the ultimate podcast for aspiring real estate investors. I'm your host, Tiffany Watson. Join me as we discuss real estate investing for nine to fivers. We'll talk about everything from money mindsets and property ownership and different strategies you can use to invest in real estate. I want to empower investors, especially those of us who are working full time, who want to navigate the world of real estate, uncover the secrets to building wealth, generate passive income to achieve financial freedom. Equip yourself with resources from experts, practical tips, and step-by-step guides on how to kickstart your real estate journey. We'll also hear from nine to fivers who started to build their own portfolios, what they did and how they did it, so you can do it too. Tune in and transform your main job into your biggest silent investor in your real estate investment business. This is your Aid to Assets. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Aid to Assets podcast. I'm your host, Tiffany Watson, where I get the opportunity to interview nine to fivers who have started and scaled their real estate portfolios and the professionals who help them do it. And so today, I am so excited about my guest today because he has this game mastered and is helping other people get out in these real estate streets too. So, Larick, how you doing? I am amazing, amazing. So before we get started, why don't you tell the people a little bit about who you are, where you are, and what you do? All right. My name is Larick Calhoun. I founded an organization called To Excel, where we empower people to excel through real estate. We're turning that mission into a little bit broader statement where we're going to, or more intentional statement, where we're going to empower people to make money in real estate while making a difference. So I started the organization over 20 years ago where I was making a lot of money. I didn't feel like I was making a big enough difference. So I've been playing with that model a little while. I ended up saying I want to educate, teach people how to make it. And so we've been doing education, coaching, training for that amount of time. But I'm also an active real estate investor. So I buy and flip houses occasionally. And I also I have a commercial space that um, I have in Cleveland, Ohio. That's where I'm based out of. I'm based out of North Carolina now, but I actually have 50 years in Cleveland, Ohio before moving to North Carolina. So we have two locations. It's myself and my wife to run the organization. And that's pretty much you know who we are. Love it. Thank you so much for sharing. And we're so excited to have you on the show. So y'all go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. As you already hear, Larick got a lot of experience. So you know how we do around here. Get your notes. We want to take good notes so that way we can execute. So Larick, before we even jump into how you got started and all of the amazing things that you've accomplished, we like to start with receipts. So can you tell us a little bit about over the years that you've been in real estate? What's your portfolio like now? How many houses have have you bought, sold, flipped, all that good stuff? All right. So over the years, I mean, it's literally in the hundreds. I didn't even probably should have count because I flipped them for myself and flipped them for investors that I was helping to flip properties for. Let's call that portfolio development. So a part of my business was always, you know, it was funding people, coaching them. Even before I was even a coach, you know, I was a loan officer and I was funding people deals. So I helped them flip and then I was flipping. So it's in the hundreds easily. There's been millions of dollars, millions of dollars that have flowed through this account. And then also the current day. So when I turned 50, right before 50, I got married. My wife and I decided to liquidate, sell everything right after the pandemic and move to North Carolina. We have a property left in Cleveland and we have a commercial suite that I'm in right now that I recently began the process of purchasing. I'm going to be buying up a block here. Uh, So I'm on a a street in Cleveland where we're doing a buyback to block strategy. So I'm inside a 4,500 square foot building. This is the one I'm purchasing. And I have another one up the street that's about 7,000 square feet that I'm in the process of purchasing. And then we're going to transform the community. It's kind of have a black Wall Street feel. So if you went out this door and looked down to the left, pretty much every building you see is owned by myself, our team. I'll call it our network. So it's a a true revitalization opportunity. So currently now rebuilding an actual hold portfolio, which will be mostly commercial businesses. And just to tell you a little brief about why and what, I'm a coach and I love business. 
I love real estate. Residential real estate is okay. And a lot of times the people are in those are in need of a home and they go to their job, you know, which is what you have a large audience of. And, um, and then they come home and they make their rent or their mortgage. But sometimes they fall short and they need to be able to figure out how to make money. And then they come and find entrepreneurship and business. I am on that side already. And so instead of me having a residential home where I know they are gonna need business at some point or real estate, then my suites are called B suites, where you can be who you're supposed to be. And each one of my rooms, like the salon lofts, are all designated to different entrepreneurs that just step out before or after their job or uh, and, they, and they build businesses out of these suites. I'm going to duplicate this throughout the country, and that's going to be our new rental property. It's just commercial space broken down into suites for entrepreneurs that are trying to be who they're supposed to be. Wow. I absolutely. There's so much there that you just shared that I want to unpack. One, yes, buy back the block. Like I'm from North Carolina. And so I, there are areas like Durham, North Carolina, where we had a black Wall Street here that people aren't as familiar with. So I'm very familiar with the concept and spent some time in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so like love the idea of recreating what we've had in history that a lot of people surprisingly don't. Well, I guess it's not really surprising that they don't know this has existed throughout our history. So that is amazing. And then also one of the reasons why I was really excited to have you on the show is because we often do talk solely about residential, not realizing commercial is still real estate. And there is a lot of money that can be made in real estate. And as we are adopting the mindset of we're not just buying property, we are buying businesses, we are building businesses for ourselves that can free us, like you mentioned, to be whatever it is that we have been called and commissioned to be, instead of just at a job where we may not feel that same purpose and fulfillment. And so I love that you have basically achieved and excelled in one area and have shifted and continue to evolve and grow into another and are taking people along with you. Yes, absolutely. That's the plan. <laughs> love it. So let's go back then. Let's go back and get started. Before all of the glory that you have now, what was it about real estate that wanted you to get started from the beginning? Well, I was a, a barber at the age of 29. And I remember a gentleman stood out front of my barber shop and uh, he was standing there and I said, hey man, you want a haircut? You know, I'm a barber, you can come on in. He said, oh yeah, I'll come check you out one day. And I said, okay. I said, now what do you do? He said, well, I'm in from Miami and I'm just checking out the territory here and you know, I do real estate. I'm like, oh wow, what is that? I mean, well, I know what it was, but what do you do in it? Because my mom used to do real estate when I was younger. And I didn't pay attention to it then because I was younger and I was thinking like, why are you buying this really ugly house and we're kids and I don't want to stay here. And and she bought it and had all this stuff in it and she's just started fixing it up over the years. And I'm like, wow, you know, in hindsight being 2020, I knew what real estate was, but I didn't know how to get in it. He was saying that he knew what it was and he was an investor and he would fix and sell houses. I said, wow, I, said, I would love to do something like that. And he was like, oh, yeah, I can mentor you. And I'm like, wow, OK, I would love to learn that. And that's what started it. Him saying that and me having some memory of it kind of created the start for me in it. And he told me he could make, you know, make a lot of money in it. I was, you know, of course, trying to make money. I was cutting hair. And, uh, and that just sparked my interest. So I'll just stop right there just to answer the question specifically. Talk about divine timing. That is amazing. So what was that transition like for you then as you started to get into real estate yourself? It was a little rough in the beginning because I was on one path of becoming an entrepreneur in the barber business of one year. So I was making a little bit of money, but I was still building my clientele. And then I decided to make this pivot. I want to, you know, change up my little career, if you will. And so when he gave me the opportunity, he said, well, you need to learn about the money. So how do you do that? He said, well, you just got to try to find somewhere, you know, like you could look at being a coming loan officer or you can do something to learn about the money. If you learn about the money, you can master the business. I'm like, wow, how do you do that? So I sat down and he talked about divine intervention. One of the guys that was two chairs over from me, I was sharing with him what I was inspired about. And the guy in his seat was like, man, I know a loan officer company. His guy's name is Tony, man. You could probably go over there and... You know, and he's always looking for other loan officers. I'm like, what's a loan officer? I don't want to be a police. You know what I mean? Like, like no, it's an officer. It's a, <laughs> I mean, literally, that's, I'm like, I'm be a police officer? Like a loan? So I, so either way, he connected me with him. I ended up connecting with him. I started a little bit shadowing with this other mortgage company about two weeks later. That was kind of over because I asked a few people. Tony is where I stayed at. 
And Tony began to give me the vision. Now, of course, loan officer, if it was able to be quickly attained as a loan officer, you didn't have a salary. It was just strictly commission, which I was okay with. I've been an entrepreneur all my life. I only had a couple of jobs when I was like 18 and 21. So I'm like, okay, I can do this. So I started building. I started trying to learn. And no one around me at that time was making a killing. They were making some money, but they were older. I was like 30 at that time. Most of them were like 40 and up. And so I'm sitting there thinking like, man, I'm like, man, I'm really making any money, but I know there's money in here. I just want to be an investor. So I kept on trying to go down this investor path, but they was refinancing houses. First time home buyer. I'm like, not interested. I'm trying to do fix and flip. So I want to learn about that money. So little by little, uh, that kind of wore me down because I would go and split my vision between barbering and loan origination with investing as a dream. At about three months in, both were struggling because you'll hear at some point in this conversation on the keys of success is that kind of what you focus on expands. If you focus on two different things, then they both are going to expand. If they're not in the same direction, they can pull you. So I was being pulled, trying to concentrate on one, trying to concentrate on the other, and I wasn't being effective in either one. So it came to a point where three months later, I was starting to lose my little apartment I was behind on my note, my bills, but I still had this vision of becoming a successful real estate person. And I remember the guy, Tony, uh, the owner of the company, pulling me and he said, man, if you're going to do this business, you're going to have to figure out if you're going to keep straddling his friends. You're hanging with your old friends, you're in your barber business, and then you're coming here trying to create a new world and have a new vision. And it's like straddling the fence. You can't move on that fence. And I got that visual. And I said, man, that's deep. And so I went on and committed to that side. And I ended up letting the barber side go, even though I didn't have any evidence I was going to make money. And I ended up going on another three months. It got worse. <laughs> and then three months later, I ended up being able to, you know, start closing deals. But that journey was very challenging in the beginning. You know, and I would, I would have had some of the knowledge I have today when I'm coaching people, I would have had a better path. So uh, so just to answer your question, the journey was a little choppy getting to the point of just even to that step one, you know, the journey of real estate investing had its own challenges, too, which I could talk about if you want to go into that. But in that one moment, just making the transition to get into that world, you know, it was a, it was a little choppy in the beginning and had I had a little bit better plan. I could have had a um, a, a more smoother transition. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. What was it during that time that kept you going? Because you mentioned that you decided to go all in with the loan officer and you were already in a stressful and challenging financial situation when you made that decision. And then it was another three months before you actually started to see fruit from what you were doing. What kept you going when it could have been so easy to just go back and cut hair because that was what you had knew was going to work? Yeah, what kept me going was, you know, my dream of just being in my mind, wildly successful. You know, I wanted to make a lot of money when I was a kid. You know, I always had, when I grew up, I want to be rich. So my vision is always to be an entrepreneur, a businessman, to be rich or wealthy, you know. And so that vehicle had promised some portions of that dream. And I wanted to hold on to it as long as I could to make it keep its promise. And when I was in the barber business, I could make money, but it did not really feel like I could get rich. When I was looking at real estate and studying it, I felt like, man, real estate gets people rich. It helps them become wealthy. And that made me excited. And so all I knew is that I wasn't going to quit until I can get to that goal. So that's what kept me going was just the desire. It wasn't the desire like I have now, which is to empower people. It was a desire to strictly get rich. Mm -hmm. you know, that's mm -hmm. what I wanted. Not wealthy, okay. rich. Just straight up, I wanted to be paid. I wanted the luxury <laughs> to play with it. I wanted what I wanted as a little knucklehead kid trying to run around the streets, being bad, trying to hustle. Now, all those dreams that got shattered along the way, I wanted them, and I wanted them in a legal manner. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, you mentioned that hindsight, of course, being 2020, looking back, there were different ways that you would have prepared yourself for that transition and what you do even when you're coaching individuals now. Can you share a little bit about what that looks like, especially for people who are wanting to make this transition and commit into focusing on real estate? 
I would speak to it this way. And although at 52 years old, I've only had three years of actual nine to five work experience, I still have talked to and I still resonate with what that looks like because I run my business kind of the same way. So I am employed. I'm self-employed. So when what I would share with a person that's on a nine to five and have their savings and, and they want to be able to stick their toe in the water is to, number one, get a coach or mentor. It doesn't have to be a paid coach. You could just get a mentor and do sweat equity. If you have the means, then get a paid coach because a lot of times where you put your money at, you focus better and it focuses better on you because it owes you. But if you don't have the means, I have um, been able to start with just mentors and I use my sweat equity and time to shadow that person through the experience. So that's the number one, not read a book. It's fine reading a book and all that. But if you really want to know the breadth of what it is that you're getting ready to do, because a book doesn't give you the emotion or the experience. If you get with a mentor or a coach, they're going to guide you through. And if they're good at what they do, they're going to help you find a lane based on your strength. If you are in a business where you're an administrator, or accountant, someone that manages things, then you may want to start with landlording, managing properties because you're going to have transferable skills. If you're a person that's in the business of sales or, or, or empowerment or motivation or influence, then you may want to get into wholesaling or real estate agent or something that has to do with using that gift. If you're a person that deals with big numbers and big business and big numbers in the, in the corporation because you're managing 20 and $30 million budgets, then you may want to come out the gate looking into new construction because you can start in any of those paths. So all of those, if you're a service-based person, you're like, look, I'm just really good at cleaning. Then it's still a multi, you know, it's a, it's a multi-billion trillion dollar industry. You could come in and say, I'm going to start off cleaning everything that somebody makes and make my money to be able to own something. So I would start off with a mentor or a coach so I can then add to the second thing, which is called a plan. Because if you have a mentor or a coach, they're going to help you with the vision. And then a vision then can come down into a step-by-step plan. And then from there, you just lay out how long it takes to get that plan achieved. And that, vi- that uh, coach or mentor can help you validate what that looks like. That's where I would start for those people. If I had hindsight, I had a little bit of that, but my pants was on fire. I need to make money yesterday. And I just did not resonate. And next thing you know, it's 23 years later. And I'm like, shoot, some of the bumps and bruises, it's, it took me back. You know, I love, they call it fast and slow and slow as fast. I hurry up and got to doing a half a million dollars a year at one point um, in my loan business and, and flip business. But then I turned around and lost it all in 08. So I had to start over. You know what I mean? So it was like, well, shoot, you know, if I'd have started, I could have did 200000 a year and coasted to a million a year had I had a little bit more patience and coaching and plan. Yes, absolutely. So y'all in the comments, put vision, then plan. And I'm really glad that you made that distinction that our vision and our plan are not the same things. The vision is this just the big, the grandiose, what do we want our life to be like? And the plan, the steps of how we are actually going to make that vision come to life. So I love that differentiation. You're working as a loan officer now. So you're seeing the different many assets uh, that you can do or avenues that you can take in real estate. When was it that you actually started investing in your own properties? I tried to invest in my own property around five months in, even though I was struggling with the loan business, I tried to get a hard money loan and buy a property, fix it up to sell it. And it was going, I think it was even four months in, and it was going kind of bad. Uh, I didn't have enough experience and I was kind of getting stuck in. That's why my mentor, the owner, came along and said, Rick, it's like by the time you sell that property, you could have done X, Y, Z in loans and made this amount of money. So I started about four months in on the first project, got that investment done. I did successfully get it sold. It was a lot of loss in it, a lot of pain in it, but I did get it sold. When it's sold, I may be a little bit off at that time. I'm just sitting there thinking that the actual first flip was after I made the loan. Because I remember him asking me about my focus. I think I was trying to get that flip. 
And I ended up actually doing it after the January month that I ended up making this massive amount of money. No, it was before. I take it back. Because that's what Max actually made me really click into what he said. Because I was trying to flip that property. I did make some money. It was about four months in. And it, it didn't make as much money as I was supposed to make. And then when he told me to start really focusing on the loan business to just make it consistent, that's when I started like bringing them both together. So right in that four to six month area is when I did my first slip. Okay, so let me make sure I have this right, because you were about three months, you were shadowing the fence when you were doing, you were still cutting hair and then you were being a loan officer. And then you decided I'm going to double down and fully focus on being a loan officer. But you were still also trying to recoup from the financial challenges that you were having, right? Yeah. Okay. And so I remember trying to be, you know, I was being thirsty and I got with a mentor and I tried to get in that property because back then it was easy to be like no money down and a guy was like, getting more money down and, and, and flip this property. And I remember getting into it because it didn't actually sell till after that one window where I actually started making money because I got in it. I put them, I got my little appraisal done. And back then you could roll the appraisal into the deal. So I got the appraisal in there done. I'm in there. They're doing the draws off the property. I'm still not making any money. I got mortgage notes on it. But the mortgages back then, you would pull them out the, um, out the actual hard money loan. So I'm trying to move that, but that's not saving me. It was actually bearing me more. And that's when the loan company was like, man, you need to focus on these loans. And that's when I started doing these foreclosure. That's when I learned how to do short sales. Okay. I started negotiating all these deals for this one lady had about 25 houses, Shirley Morton. And she had all these houses that were going back to the bank. And I remember talking to her about if I can do what I learned was a short sale to get them out of foreclosure. And that, which I'll go into shortly, but that allowed me to start getting some inventory up against the loans that I had written for people. And that's where I started actually starting to make some money at January and was that 2001 is when I started actually making money. I believe that flip ended up closing shortly after that. But yes, that's the um, that's kind of the timeline path there. Trying to, I hadn't hadn't even talked about this stuff in a while. It's like twenty some years ago, but now I'm just kind of calculating it out. But yes, that's what that's when I started doing my first flip somewhere in that little window right there. Okay. Okay. So now talk to us about because it sounds like your focus was still divided a little bit. Because you were in, you were in the loan officer, but you knew you wanted to do the flip. And it wasn't until you really sat down and said, okay, I'm going to work with Shirley and get these properties under contract or, or with the short sales completed. And that supplied the finances you need to finish the flip, get that soul and continue to move. Talk to us, especially when for people, we have a lot of listeners who they so desperately want to get that first deal. They are anxious to get in the game and it can be difficult to know what is the right point and how they need to prepare themselves. Can you share a little bit about like how you coach your students on that part of their journey? So I always tell people, and that's, I do the little one plus one equals, and they say two, I say, no, it equals 11, look closer. I always tell them, partner up with somebody. That's the fastest, easiest way to success in real estate. Even if they're novice, even if they're all starting together, because the leverage, another principle, leverage equals speed, leveraging each other's energy, time, financial resources, and then going after that first property is invaluable especially if you happen to have someone that maybe already has the property, maybe they have the money to buy the property, and then you have the money and a team to bring the money to fix up the property, and then you all go through the experience. Because people, the reason why they don't pull the trigger, because there's a lot of newbies and only about 20% pull the trigger in the first two to three years. The reason they don't pull the trigger is because of fear. And the reason the fear is there is because you haven't experienced it. Right. Uh, they say faith comes from hearing and hearing and hearing. And it's also doing and doing and doing. So the more that you actually engage in it, you, that shot, that's why mentoring and internships are in college. You know, they allow you to go intern so you can get over the hump in medical practice. Go through these hours first. But in, in the real estate, people just want to go straight to surgery, straight to medical, straight to the practice without having the opportunity to be able to partner with someone that can work through the study groups, you know, the, the mentorship, the, uh, all those different things. So those people that just want to get started, 
Start with somebody that's already doing it. You can find them at a local real estate investors association. Those are everywhere, right? You go plug into one, you find somebody in there that raises their hand on newbie night, or you find someone that raised their hand on experience night that says that, hey, I'm experienced, I got all this going on. See how you can serve that person or see how you can partner with that person. Hey, let's go be fr afraid together. You know, so it, I mean, it, it just, it works. And, and you can draw a small group of people together. And like you said, go after a property. And after that one, you may split up the revenue, but you also cut in half the fear. Cut in half the fear and gain the experience. And you gain the experience. Now tell us, what was that principle again? You said leverage and what? Leverage equals speed. Leverage equals speed. Okay. So you leverage another person's time and it speeds you up to that lesson. You start on your own, right? It's like you get out the house and you start walking to get to a mile destination. It'll take you whatever amount of time it takes you to get to that mile. If you turn around and ask somebody to give you a ride in their car, you leverage their car and you got there in probably three times the speed. So and the same thing is like my vehicle is already moving that way. You're just now getting started. Get in my vehicle and I'll get you to that destination a little bit faster. So leverage always equals speed. Leverage always equals speed. I love it. I love it. Okay. Now talk to us a little bit because you were doing this flip. And now at this present point, you've done hundreds of flips. Talk to that new investor that wants to take on their first flip. But like you mentioned, the fear still has them a little paralyzed of the unknown of what to expect when trying to renovate this property. So you want me to share with how to overcome the fear part? Yes. So one of the things is the more you know, the more fearless you become. So studying everything from the uh, what is going to take because in sales you have to understand your product and same thing when you're talking about getting into real estate investing so when you get in you want to start going to your home depots you want to start learning about how much material costs is one thing for you to tell somebody hey that quote includes material and labor and they say yes it does but you don't know how much the material order labor actually costs so then you're at the um, helm of their at the mercy of their decision so if you go out and you find out a two by four and you find out how much that two by four costs. You find out how much a, a sheet of drywall costs. The difference between the drywall, the green board, which when, why is this drywall green and why is this one not? You know, why is this one thin? Why is this one thick? When do I use it? You know, some of the simplest things create the biggest mistakes. What is a drywall screw? You know, do I use a nail in drywall? You know, how long should it take in order for someone to put up the drywall? It's on Google. It'll tell you how long you should take. So these are things that you can familiarize yourself with that when you go into a space, you can say, you know, I, I know a little bit of something about this. Hey y'all, Tiffany here. Are you looking to purchase or sell real estate? As you know, I'm your aid to assets and I want to help you with all of your real estate endeavors. Whether you're local here like me in the Fayetteville, North Carolina area, I can then help you purchase or sell your next property. If you're looking to purchase or sell outside of North Carolina, let me know too. I can still help you. I have a team of agents all over the country that I can connect you with to partner on your next deal. Let's get to the closing table, y'all. We buy our way to wealth, whether that's buying right or selling better. Can't wait to hear from you. Click on the link in the bio if you want more information on how to personally work with me or an agent on my team. Talk to you soon. Okay, so talk to us a little bit now. You mentioned that you are taking a shift in your business where it's not just about your um, members acquiring real estate, but it's making sure that they are making money as they are um, acquiring real estate and making a difference. Talk to us about that distinction and why that's significant for you. So the distinction first, um, there is such thing as people just getting, you see people all the time and it's unfortunate, but people get into real estate and all they know is what they want out of it. And they don't think about on the other side of real estate that there's a person that's inside that space is going to be impacted one way or the other by that transaction. Either you're going to give someone housing, 
you're going to remove someone from housing if you're into the tax sale. To buy a tax auction home means that someone had to lose the home to taxes, right? It's cause and effect, right? So at the end of the day, you know, when you're looking at the opportunities, yep, okay, so it, someone didn't pay their taxes, it doesn't make them a bad person. So at the end of the day, when you buy that property, you do have an opportunity to be able to create programming that can help that person move to their next process, to their next, you can have a solution. Now, some people are going to force you to be what you may end up having to be at the end of the day because they're going to be in an emotional space. But at least having a plan other than 30-day notice from the attorney, you got to be out on your ear or, or else. So that's saying the side that when you get into real estate, it's not a, a dog eat, eat dog world. It's not a you against the people world. So people can't get in. They only think about the money. I'm just going to make this money. I'm going to get this money. The least I give you, the more I make, right? The least I put in your home, the more profit I have at the end for my home. So that's the side that can easily be sold because people get in with blinders and they don't think about the human aspect of it. On the making a difference side, I've made a difference and tried to make a difference and also got myself in a situation where I still needed to do business and I didn't make any money because I was so busy trying to make a difference. So I was empowering people, giving them information, giving it to them for free, letting people stay past their date. It's like, no, I do want to help you. But the lease agreement says that you're to pay rent. If you don't pay the rent, then I do have to move through a process called eviction. So I'm not being mean, but at the end of the day, I can't be kind or my mentor would say nice. Nothing in me cares enough, right? So to do this, then I need to do it in a proper way to, in order for me to make money. I didn't always balance that properly. Either I was on this side to making money, not thinking about everything I need to think about the people. I was on this side trying to give so much that I wasn't thinking about myself and how I can make a difference, you know, in, at the same time. So those two. So how I now teach people is how to negotiate, how to be able to do community development, community revitalization, how to be able to include. At this earlier, my doorbell was ringing from one of the neighborhood, um, I'd say my neighborhood natives. Natives are all out in the community. They be all in my park next door and everything, right? And I've made acquaintance with them since I've been here. I've put them to work. They're now coming over and saying, he was over here this morning. He's like, man, I saw you had a washer and dryer when I was in there helping you clean up. I said, uh, well, it's gone now. He said, well, I want to be able to get myself cleaned up a little bit, wash my clothes, because if I'm going to be representing you, I want to be able to be, you know, able to represent you clean. He said, and then I want to be in the meetings. I know you don't have a time, but I want to sit with you when you have time, and I want to be able to be in the meeting with you. And I'm like, oh, well, I could be with you. He said, no, the meeting's with you and your team. I want to be, I got ideas, I'm smart. Sometimes I may cut people off because I get excited. He said, but, but I, I just be having an idea on my mind right then. This man was trying to join the team. He keeps saying, I want to be on your team. I got to do, because I'm in the area we're going to have to transform, right? I'm going to make money. I'm in a building. This building is making money right now. We already dang near at capacity within 40 days of me getting the keys. So I'm making money, but I'm also out there making a difference because, because Yanni, Timmy, Lucky, Omar, Joshua, Sherry, Diamond, whose birthday is April 23rd. You know, all of them. They're in their street. Mike, who said, man, I got to get out these streets, man. I don't want to steal no more. I was married 16 years. You know, I got divorced. I just hit the street, left everything. But I got to stop this stealing. These are people that, that I feel like I'm making a difference. And I got a choice. I could just sit here and make money off my building. Right? I can let the, the streets take care of the streets or the police take care of the streets. No, that's my job. And it's not that difficult. And some of them work harder. Yanni pulled up early. He was he walked and got the opportunity on time at 9 o'clock, working with one of the people that we just got a property to across the street to help them fix state plot. So now they went from hanging in the park to working and cleaning up the park. And that's what I want to teach people is don't be afraid of your people. And black people, we're notorious for being afraid of our people. It's like you can't be afraid of your people. Now, there's some people that's out there that's a little dangerous. You have to qualify and be careful with what I'm saying because you just can't run out there inexperienced. But if you leave out, lead out there with your heart, there's not been one ministry that's come in the neighborhood 
and just got jumped or robbed because they was donating turkeys. Now, you hang around and you got your Gucci on and you just flying and hanging out and you ain't speaking to nobody, they probably going to tell you to come on with it, what you got in your pocket. But if you walk in and give some love, people know the difference just like animals know the difference. We all got instincts. So that's how I balance those two worlds. That's how I help people approach business and real estate. Because how you do anything is how you do everything. So you got to do it that way for you to do it in real estate. So I'm not telling you, do it in real estate this way. I'm saying do it in life this way. Then you're going to do it in real estate this way. Because it wasn't real estate to be just this person. This is me wanting to be the best, you know, the best person I could be. And I carry it into real estate. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good. Okay. Now, I'm curious because there's such an evidence of the passion that you have, not just for the industry, but for the people in the industry that you are getting to impact, whether it's your students that are learning or the community in which you're helping to revitalize. How did you maintain this spark when you mentioned you previously sold off all of your other properties, you had lost a lot in the last recession? How did you build this back up if it needed to be built or maintain that spark for this love when you had seen personally and experienced such a loss? So you ever seen the movie Terminator? You remember the part where that they, they beat that Terminator down to almost oblivion. And do you remember the one little light, what color it was that was flashing in his in his eye? is a little red light. Yes. That red light, that red light is called purpose. That's how I stayed, is that when I was down and I didn't have no money, and I was in the basement of my church taking a shower, pulling up in a car they were looking for, embarrassed because I was the man, and everybody knew it, and I had to somehow come to grips with the fact that I had lost everything overnight. And people were passing me, and like, man, you got all those Lexuses, and you got all this stuff, and I didn't have enough money to even get gas. And the only thing I remember as I was given an opportunity to make $150 a week, because there was nobody that could hire me at my church. They just said, Lorick, you, you can do $150 a week if you could just do something around here. I'll take it. And I found a shower in the basement that was abandoned because we inside of a sportsplex. And I would leave from where I would lay my head and I would come over there and I would take a shower. And because I was a barber, I would line myself up and I still had my clothes in the space I was at. And I was so determined to win because my company was to excel. All I ever thought about was helping people to excel. All I ever wanted to do was excel. All I ever wanted to do was win. So purpose, once you understand your why and your purpose, that's what kept me up and got what kept me going. And I remember helping a young lady, EB is her initials, and she was losing her home, and I remember helping her save it. And I remember thinking, like, you got to be some type of person, Lorick, for you to help somebody save a home and you don't even have one. And I was excited. And I served so hard at that church for that year in that condition that I knew that I was born to empower. And so that's what kept it up. And then I started coming back like the Terminator. Little by little, I started filling back out. And I found that if God put something on your life and he called it to your spirit and to your vision, that you can reinvent and rebuild yourself just like the Terminator, just like a phoenix rising from being burnt down. And that's what happened. I didn't necessarily have the thought that it was gonna fully become. I just knew I wasn't going to quit, and then it became. And I ended up attracting an opportunity that freed me. That's what happened and made it just rebirth itself. When you work really hard at something, people will remember you for how, worked, how hard you worked at it. And they came back for me and lifted me up. You know what I mean? And when they talk about, for those that subscribe to uh, everybody got a different way to subscribe to religion, but I always tell people the most powerful brand that ever hit the earth was Jesus Christ's name, right? People always remember the story of the resurrection, whether they're Muslim, whether they're Jehovah's Witness, I mean, or, or, or if Buddhist, everybody still knows that there was a point when somebody went down and came back up. No matter which way you subscribe, there's a, there's a statement of a down and out in a up, right? That's the part. That's the part that got me going is 
I knew that there was some reason I was supposed to be up. And if you just know it, you will get back up. That's it. If you just know in your heart that this is what you're supposed to do, you're going to get up. And that's what happened with me. I just kept getting up and I keep getting up. I get blows every year, every day, you know, but that's that's that part. I knew the reason I was supposed to be up. That's so good. That is so good. Lorick, I could sit here and talk your ear off all day long because I know there is so much more information that you can give to our listeners and especially over your journey. But I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I want to just thank you so much for your transparency and your candidness because this is freeing someone as they are thinking that they, they're too far gone, they've messed up or they just don't have enough. And so I just really want to share and give you your flowers and thank you for you continuing to pour into other people and letting them know their story's not over. Yep, absolutely. Yep, thank you. Yes, it's definitely not over. You know, as Brown always says, uh, Les Brown says, if you fall, you land on your back, make sure you land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. So it's like, just make sure you just angle it to fall on that back, you know, and uh, and then people do. And I do want to share to that, that one person that may be listening, you know, you do have to just keep pushing. And times are very difficult right now. And some of the things that you're feeling that you think that it's are only you, they're only you that's experiencing it. And that it's only you that's got that story is not. Other people have that story. And the more that you know that, the more you'll feel normal. And the more you feel normal, the more you'll get back to work. But it's when we feel abnormal, we feel like we're cursed, that we start doing and thinking different things that we don't want to move on in life, that we want to give up on life. But once you start talking to people, you'll find that other people share the same anxiety, the same fear, the same concerns, the same financial uh, struggles, and the same aspirations. And you get around those people, and that's where your iron sharpens iron comes in at, and that's how you begin to win. So I want to just say that to that person that may be listening, because there's always one. It's always one. It's always one. So before we get out of here, I know you have a community. If people want to tap in and learn more from the, the well of knowledge that you have, tell us a little bit about what it is and how they can be a part. All right. So i um, been working on just trying to be more visible to the World Wide Web. You know, I've always been an introvert and I finally got pulled out to start doing more in the public. So I am on like Instagram, I'm on Facebook, you know, you can look up Larick Calhoun or The Real Biz Coach, you know, the way my name is spelled, L-A-R-I-C-K Calhoun, C-A-L-H-O-U-N, it's The Real Biz Coach on Instagram and Real Biz Coach on Facebook. Those are kind of like the areas you can follow me on, and and then we have a, a platform called enetworkworldwide.com, it should be where you can at least request to be a member. I know we were making some changes on it to make it private for people to come to our events. But if you like on any of those or send me an inbox, I'll send an invite to the community. If you can't just get on there, I know we're in the process of changing it to meet these B-Suite needs. But, um, but yes, those two areas are the main two areas that person can follow me at if they want to just call the office, area code 216-916-9456 if they just wanted to call the office and uh, just get directly in touch. I know people be like, follow me over here. They're like, well, I want to call. So that's, uh, that's you know, call anytime and, and we can talk. Love that. And y'all, all of that information will be in the description so you can make sure that you tap in with Lorick um, if you're interested. So Lorick, the last thing before we leave is one of the things we like to do here on the Aid to Assets podcast is a little bit of vision casting. And so we believe that we write the vision and make it plain and by setting our intentions. So my question to you is one year, three years from now, your choice, what is going to be true for you and your business in real estate? All right. So over the next, say, let's three years, uh, one of the visions I've always had is to create a model that people can duplicate all over the world. So in the next three years, you know, we do have an office in Detroit where it's already the same. You go in there, you'll see the same uh, um, poster, um, banners, your same theme on the wall, the building. It has little small um, 
a desk in there that people can use. It's not as big as this building. We have a small office in Cary, North Carolina, that we're getting ready to do the same decor to. And then there'll be teams of 2XL, uh, what we call Team 2XL, which is entrepreneurs that have decided to carry the same torch. If that could be a State Farm or a Bell Bondsman on every corner, then why not be a Team 2XL uh, coach and a real biz coach on every corner and empower people to make money in real estate while making a difference. So I look to have a network of people that embody the same spirit, that embody the same mission, that want to make money in real estate while making a difference, that'll have their either events going on in their area or either have an office or a combination of two and just replicate everything we build here that will then turn around and show them how to build in their area, just like they do Chick-fil-A. That chicken sandwich is perfect everywhere you go. So we want to franchise empowerment, basically. And that's what I look to see and I plan to see over the next three years is more of what we have here everywhere. Wow. Y'all heard it here first. Definitely. That is super, super exciting. I wish you nothing but continued success on all that you do in the communities in which you are in. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Well, you all, this has been another amazing episode of the Aid to Assets podcast. I hope that you took away so many jewels from Larick. Definitely, this is one that I'm going to have to replay. And think about it, just y'all. Write the vision, make it plain, and know that then you need to create a plan. There are steps that you can execute, but you can do this. Until next time, take care, y'all. Thank you for tuning in to another insightful episode of A to Asset. Remember, your journey from nine to fiver to successful real estate investor is within reach. Keep learning, keep growing, and keep investing in your future. If you'd like to know more, connect with me on Instagram at A to Assets. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Until next time, happy investing.